a Model S Plaid that can do 0 to 60 in under 2 seconds, a Tesla for under $25,000, and batteries by the terawatt hour. It's been a heck of a day. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. If you enjoy the video, definitely hit the thumbs up button and for sure subscribe for more of this. Also subscribe because when we hit 500 subscribers, we're going to do a giveaway. So that's really soon. So as I was listening to the battery day, <laughs> I started taking notes. I ended up with like a page and a half of that, but I wanted to go over all the really huge announcements that Tesla made today. It's, it's a really large thing. Most of them have to do with the battery in some way at least, but a few of them are, are, are tangentially related, I guess. But I'd like to cover, because it was a kind of, there was a lot of little things. It wasn't like one gigantic moment of discovery or something, right? You know, it wasn't like discovering special relativity and the world changed. It's a whole bunch of amazing engineering procedures, some of which I got right in my predictions, some of which I didn't. <laughs> you can go back and watch that episode if you're interested. Uh, but anyway, I think it's really interesting to look at how all of these different things interact and to, to look at the cost savings, the range increase, um, and the efficiency of building things that Tesla is talking about here. It's pretty amazing. So let's start with the form. This was something that kind of leaked out in the past few days. The form factor of the new batteries is going to be significantly larger. It's 80, 80 millimeters by 46 millimeters or about eight centimeters by four and a half centimeters. So not quite a Coke can size, but you know, in that range, much, much bigger than your traditional, you know, double A size battery. So that would be a 4680 or 46 millimeters by 80 millimeter size battery, as opposed to a 2170, which was 21 by 70 millimeters. Millimeters, so you know a little bit bigger but a heck of a lot fatter um, the way that they can do this is that they've gone to a tabless design process now they talk a lot in the in the battery investor day about how that increases the efficiency of manufacture but also what it does is it allows for a direct connection between multiple parts of the battery with the contact terminals which allows for less heating and it allows for a much faster transfer of electrons and a more efficient one like that plus it allows for more efficient design and building of the product so the, the tabless design is a kind of shingle design. So you can think of it almost like a roof. It's like a bunch of little shingles in a spiral that go around. And each of those has a kind of connection, as far as I understand, to the caps, the end caps, and allows electricity to flow much more directly than a single tab inside of a battery. If you've ever taken a battery apart, there's little metal tabs that stick out the end. And that's where what actually contact the, the metal caps that, you know, encase the battery. So that's a huge efficiency. It's an efficiency for manufacturing, and it's also an efficiency for storage process. In addition, there's the dry process, as people had kind of guessed with the purchase of Maxwell Technologies, although I guess they're on version four of the machine that they bought at version 1.0. So they've had to do a lot of work on this, and I guess there's some more work to go. Uh, the dry process allows for them to kind of go directly from the uh, materials in a powder form to the battery without having to go through a wet electrode process and baking it and drying it back out again and everything. So it's a huge savings in terms of manufacturing. And they, uh, Elon Musk also argued that they make, they save some money by doing it this way as well. So that's also super cool. Then we get to the anode and cathode. I know this is like super sexy stuff, but you know, <laughs> what are you going to say? So for the anode, they are moving to raw silicon, which is not only like about the most common thing on earth, right? It's sand. Uh, it, it, they're by moving to raw silicon, as opposed to engineered materials that are usually used for anodes, they are allowing for expansion by kind of coating the raw material. So the problem with silicon is it's very, very energy dense, but as it heats up, and I talked about this in a, a previous episode, as it heats up, it expands and contracts and expands and contracts, and that can crack on a microstructure, all sorts of things inside the battery. And so what they've done is I guess they've created a polymer, an elastic polymer that will coat this and it, uh, it stretches and contracts. So it basically keeps that whole area from cracking. So as far as they were talking about, they're almost using raw silicon as opposed to using a highly manufactured machine type of material. So, wow, <laughs> the cathode was a very confusing part of all of this. It's, it's a very complicated structure, but they're going to move from cobalt 
to a more of a nickel uh, based product. Now, obviously the batteries already have a lot of nickel in them, but they're going to move away from cobalt. They're also going to not just bifurcate, which is what I predicted, but they're actually going to trifurcate three, <laughs> three different branches, their battery structures. Um, by moving away from cobalt, of course, it becomes cheaper. It's also more ethical because cobalt is a very, very ethically challenged thing product because it can only be manufactured or mined in certain places in Africa and the work conditions are terrible. So moving away from that is all to the good on many, many fronts. So for the low energy density, which it sounds like maybe for inexpensive cars and for the power walls and mega packs and things like that, they're going to use an iron phosphate technology, which had been discussed before. For these kind of intermediate models, which I guess would be like Model 3s and Model S's and so forth, they're going to do, go with a nickel manganese type of cathode. And then for the very high use cases like the Cybertruck and the Semi-Truck, they're going to go to a high pure nickel content cathode. So they're going to have three different types of chemistry in their batteries, as opposed to just two is what I predicted. As far as the cathode process is concerned, they're going to remove a lot of the legacy process, which I guess turns things into like nickel becomes a nickel sulfate. A huge amount of water is required to reconstitute that back as nickel and everything. So essentially what they're going to do is they're going to take the mined nickel, they're going to pull it out of the ground, they're going to do the processing themselves, it's going to become a no waste process and there's no, there's not going to be all this metal refining that happens before they get it. They won't have a ton of waste water and poison water and everything that's really terrible for the environment. So they're going to create a better environmental and much, much cheaper process to produce the cathodes. They're also going to do on-site lithium infusion. I gather they said that they have access to a 10,000 acre area of the Nevada desert, which is high in lithium. And apparently the whole world is high in lithium. I didn't realize how much lithium there was, but they were certainly saying there's a lot of lithium out there. It's a very it's a very common material and apparently very easy to get a hold of out of the dirt. They're going to reduce the travel time for these materials by almost mining them on site so that they don't have to travel around the world a ton of times. And I guess they're able to use just table salt, sodium chloride, to extract the lithium from the raw ore. So not only is this sustainable and they can recycle the salts and everything, but they're going to dig up the dirt, they're going to extract the lithium, and then they're going to put the dirt back in so that we don't get these gigantic strip mines that are kind of the bane of so much of the world right now. So that's a huge, huge advantage. It's a really wonderful environmental thing for the local environment, but also environmentally sustainable for everything involved. As far as recycling is concerned, they made it very clear that over the next decade or so, which is kind of the lifetime of the battery, they're going to become expert at recycling materials themselves. As in general, it's cheaper to recycle something once it's dug out of the ground than it is to mine it originally. So the goal is going to be for them to recycle almost all of the stuff that they need for new batteries from old batteries. Much more cost efficient, much better for the environment, and of course it saves them money also. And here's where we get into some interesting, interesting stuff. So they're going to use the battery packs themselves as structural material in the car. So they talked a little bit about the single piece casting that they're doing for the Model Y, now the rear. They're also gonna do the front of the Model Y as well. Uh, so they're gonna be doing this and they had to invent an entirely new uh, high strength without heating aluminum alloy so that they could directly cast it into these large form factors. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna take the battery pack itself and they're gonna use these larger cans and they're gonna put um, pressure, structural pressure from the car onto this giant pack and it's gonna become a structural portion of the vehicle which means that they can actually remove, let me see if I can find this, 370 parts are going to be removed, I assume from the Model Y or the Model 3, but they can remove, remove 370 parts because they are able to use the battery pack itself as a structural load-bearing element of the vehicle. Genius, right? You've got all these metal cylinders, so why not use them to bear the load of the machine? And I guess the shear strength in particular, which is the kind of bending strength, like one direction to the other, like, let me do that like this, shear, like that. Uh, the shear strength is going to go up by a drastic amount, which will make the car stiffer. 
It'll make it handle better. They can volumetrically reduce the size of the battery pack so that it can be more central to the car, which means the center of mass and the moment of inertia is going to be better. It also means a side-on collision would might be much less likely to cause a battery puncture, which would be a problem. In addition, the fireproof material that they're using, they are double purposing it as glue. So it will be causing the battery cans to be glued to the bottom and the top so that again, they will be part of the structure of the vehicle. Super genius. I never would have thought of that. So good for you guys. I guess that's why the smart big brain people are working at Tesla. So what does all this mean for everything? The claim is that they will have a 56% reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour. That is massive. Right now it's in the buck 40 ish range, I think, buck 30. So, this is going to put it way, way below the dollar per kilowatt hour, the magic number that will allow electric vehicles to have a sticker price that is cheaper than ICE cars. In addition, they're going to have a 54% increase in range because the vehicles will be lighter and more energy dense. So, that's a huge thing. And they're going to have a 69% investment reduction, which means the cost of building this stuff is going to go down by 69%. <clears throat> Elon, Elon really loved 69%. In fact, he said 69.420% to be exact. So, you know, <laughs> if you're an Elon fan, you understand exactly why he was so into that whole thing. So all of this is going to take place over a period of time. They said the ramp up period will take from one year to 18 months and the full, you know, push will be about three years to get up to complete speed. They're planning on being able to do by 2030, three terawatt hours of batteries per year. Uh, right now, I think they do 150 gigawatts. So that's what, uh, 20 times increase over, over like nine or 10 years. That is really, really impressive. What does this give them? Well, obviously it gives them a whole bunch of things with their current cars, but Elon Musk again reiterated his greatest uh, concern or sadness about Tesla so far is that all of their cars are rather expensive. So he's committing to a $25,000 vehicle within the next three years, plus full autonomy. He didn't really say whether that would be included in the $25,000 cost or not. I expect you'll have to pay something else for that. But still, a $25,000 base electric car that's going to cost less money than an ICE car to run is outstanding. That's going to be amazing. And finally, of course, we had to have a little bit of fun, right? So they announced the Model S Plaid. Pretty cool looking car. It does zero to 60 in under two seconds. That's pretty cool. It does the quarter mile in under nine seconds. That's amazing. It has about a 520 mile EPA rated range. So <coughs> lucid air, <coughs> clearly they were competing with that. And it has a top speed of 200 miles per hour. You can order the Model S Plaid now, but it will be about a year before it's available, which is Ah, oh, darn shame. Not that I have the kind of money that will be necessary to purchase that car, but <laughs> anyway, one can dream at least. He did not announce the price. I imagine it'll be in the $100,000 range, but what a cool upgrade to the Model S Plaid. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode. This again was just fast reactions and kind of a crystallization of what was a rather long announcement. So I hope this is valuable to you. If you did find it valuable, please be sure you subscribe for more of this and also make sure you subscribe for the 500 subscriber giveaway. And also ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is knows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>